In modern NASCAR, the concept of a winner lapping the field is pretty much an impossibility, and for many reasons. For one, NASCAR standardized their cars to a point where it is exceptionally rare for one team to find a major advantage over everyone else. Back in the early days of the sport, it was not uncommon to see the race winner finish not one but multiple laps ahead of second place. In the 1965 Southern 500, that year's would-be champion Ned Jarrett finished a staggering 14 laps ahead of runner-up Buck Baker, which to this day holds the record for the biggest margin of victory in a NASCAR race. In that race, Ned wasn't even the dominant driver, as he only led 62 of the 364 total laps, but due to the very high rate of mechanical failures that day, he coasted to the line with no one else contesting him. As NASCAR teams began spending more money on research, their equipment became more modernized as the years went on, it became exceptionally rare for multiple top-level teams to suffer mechanical failures in a single race. So in the 1994 fall race at North Wilkesboro, the last time in NASCAR history that a race winner lapped the field, the winner, Jeff Bodine, simply outdrove everyone. He led a dominating 334 out of the 400 laps and didn't have the fortune of any other contenders falling out of the race. Speaking of North Wilkesboro, one of the most dominating performances of the 2023 season was there in the All-Star Race, where the winner, Kyle Larson, opened up a 12-second lead over second place by lap 100. If not for a scheduled competition caution at the halfway point, it was entirely possible that Larson could have lapped the field by the end of the race at lap 200 had there been no other cautions. And as it turned out, there were no other cautions after the scheduled one, so all that held back Larson from a chance at breaking Bodine's record was NASCAR resetting the race artificially. Really, the only way Bodine's record could be beaten is in an event like an all-star race or a bush clash, where there are not two scheduled stage cautions. Even in a regular points-paying race, if a driver was able to lap the field in either the first or the second stage, the second-place driver would receive a free pass under the stage caution to get back on the lead lap. So for the race winner to pull it off, they would need to lap second place during the final stage and hope that the race remained green until the end. That isn't necessarily impossible, but it is more than likely that NASCAR wouldn't let that happen and would throw a phantom debris caution at some point in order to ensure the racing product appears close and competitive. But so far, no such scenario has arisen, and with how close together all the top teams are on speed, and with how many cautions occur naturally, it probably never will. That's been the case for the NASCAR Cup Series, Xfinity Series, and Truck Series, but not so much for NASCAR's newest purchase, the Arkham Menard Series. After operating separately from NASCAR since 1953, once as a competitor and then as a feeder series, Arca was officially bought out by NASCAR in 2018. Regarding talent, the series was never nearly as prestigious as NASCAR, but for a long time, the races appeared just as competitive, featuring over 30 cars per race on average up until 2017. Since then, average field sizes have fallen as low as 19.55 cars in 2020, and the performance gap between big and small teams has increased significantly. This is mostly due to the rising cost of owning an ARCA team, which some inside reports have speculated has become almost as high as owning a NASCAR Truck Series team, but with far less return on investment. But regardless, modern ARCA has become a sort of reincarnation of pre-modern NASCAR, with no scheduled stage breaks and differences in performance that, under the perfect circumstances, could almost result in a driver lapping the field. Turn four, Frank Kimmel takes the white flag here, the only driver on the lead lap, Kimmel, dominating the auto value at United National Bank 200. And in ARCA, there have been multiple instances of winners lapping the field since it last happened in NASCAR. Throughout the 90s, it was a common occurrence in this series, just like it was in the early days of NASCAR, but in the 21st century, it has only happened four times. The first time was surprisingly at Watkins Glen, where with three laps to go, there were still three drivers on the lead lap, the leader and experienced road racer John Finger in the 03, the late Blaze Alexander in the 91, and Lyndon Amick in the 99. But in true ARCA fashion, the race would end in complete chaos, so much chaos that I'm not even going to attempt to describe it, and I'm just going to show you the full finish instead. Straight away. Off the turn. Very strong. Comes to 91 Pontiac. But here oh. comes Finger. Finger man. blows right by him. Alexander's got a problem. Yeah, I was going to say, man, did John Finger score around Blaze Alexander? But it looks like Blaze has a problem, like you said, because you don't slow up like that. I'm wondering if he had a chance to Oh, look at everyone's off the racetrack. Amick goes off course. Here comes Burroughs to the inside. There's <laughs> contact. Finger and Burroughs spin. Amick gets into him, into the Armco barrier. Three of the front-running cars have all tangled. Here comes Alexander back on the gas. Kimmel, and here comes Finger. Wow, two to go. Okay, what? Now tell me, what just happened here? 
<laughs> Burroughs tried to bonsai through on the inside on the final corner and took himself out along with the leader. Hey, look, look at the damage to the 91 car, and he's going to spin again. Yeah, right now, you know, Burroughs is on the tail end of the lead lap. Uh, but you got, you know, Fingers, who was running for the lead, and then Blaze was actually, they were back racing, even though Blaze had a wrecked car. And here's and, Lyndon Amick stuck against the Armco at the inside of turn 11. And I don't know if they're going to throw a yellow or not. We're going to be coming around to get the white flag. And in Arca, you can't race back to the start-finish line. When the yellow comes out, the field is frozen. So right now, they're, oh, I'm starting to see the yellow. Oh, oh, look at this. Robert Burroughs with a damaged race car clipped the curbing, goes through the grass. Kimmel has to dodge into the inside and getting by his finger in the 0-3. This may hand the race to John Finger. Okay. <laughs> I'm totally confused right now. Look at this. There's cars everywhere. The, the yellow flag's out, so nobody can improve position. So right now, John Fingers just got to get to the start-finish line to win this race. Well, he's got to go one more lap, but you know, all he's got to do is make it to the start-finish line right now. And I think he's going to be the winner. So after all that, John Finger went on to win in his ARCA debut over second place Blaze Alexander, who didn't even finish the race due to his damage or whatever mechanical issue he was having before that, or maybe even both. But anyway, it wasn't long before another winner lapped the field, just the next year at Nashville Super Speedway. This time it was the would-be all-time series wins leader and 10 time champion Frank Himmel, but he didn't do it without any controversy. Though there is unfortunately no video footage of this race available right now, I was able to find a Motorsport.com article from the time that gives a detailed race summary. According to it, Frank Kimmel and rookie Chad Blount were the only two drivers in contention all day and were battling hard in the closing laps, not just for the win, but for the points lead. But right after Blount got by Kimmel for the race lead, Kimmel made contact with him from behind going into turn one and sent Blount hard into the outside wall. Then with his only real competition out of the way, Kimmel dominated the rest of the race and finished a lap ahead of second place Robert Burroughs on pure speed. In an interview, Kimmel claimed that the contact was just a result of hard racing, but Blount and his team obviously did not see it that way, and the two crews even fought after the race. Following Frank Kimmel's controversial win at Nashville and his eventual championship over Chad Blount, the next time that a driver lapped the field wasn't until the 2006 Hans Group 200 in Michigan. In that race, the then Cup Series rookie David Sturmey pulled away from everyone at the drop of the green flag and wasn't reeled back in until the first caution finally came out on lap 61. But by then, Sturmey and his Rusty Walls Incorporated Dodge had already put the entire field at least one lap down. And with Arcus still having yet to adopt the free pass rule, that meant everyone was trapped off the lead lap unless they were able to unlap themselves the old-fashioned way. But that day, no one could match the speed of David Sturmey, and he went on to claim his first Arca win with ease. Following Sturmey's 2006 triumph, which broke Frank Campbell's nearly four-year-long record as the most recent driver to lap the field, no one was able to replicate the feat for the rest of that season or the next, and come 2008, Arca finally adopted the free pass rule, which would make it even harder to do going forward. But in the 2008 Carolina 500 at Rockingham, the 17-year-old Cup Series prospect Joey Logano nearly pulled it off. Thanks to an insanely fast venture in a motorsports car and an exceptionally long 312-mile distance for Arca standards, Logano lapped all but the second-place driver Michael Annette. However, due to a series of late-race cautions, a few drivers received free passes, and the race ended with four other drivers on the same lap as the winner Logano. Though I'm sure there were a few more close calls after that race, David Strummey's record wasn't broken for over a decade until the third race of the 2017 season. That race at Salem Speedway was only 111 miles and 200 laps, but known for its long green flag runs and small field sizes, Salem was an optimal track for lapping the field given an utterly dominant car. At first, it was the pole sitter Travis Miller in the MDM number 28 who pulled away, but when he was passed by the 16-year-old Christian Eckes at over a quarter of the way into the race, still 13 drivers remained on the lead lap. With none of the lead lap drivers facing any mechanical issues either, it seemed that there was no chance of the winner lapping the whole field. But when Eckes got into clean air, his speed really began to show, and by lap 114, he had gotten by Travis Miller again, to put him a lap down. On top of his great venturing motorsports equipment, Eckes had the advantage of fresh tires, as after getting into the back of Gustine on lap 18 and spinning around, he was forced to come down pit road and get a new set of tires. Typically, burning a set of tires that early into a race would just be a waste of money and equipment, but as the race stayed green for over 100 laps following that caution, it turned out to be a big difference maker for the better. Approaching lap 130, Eckes had gapped second place Kyle Weatherman by 17 seconds and was closing in on third place Dalton Sargent to put him a lap down. We have to third here in just a moment. 
He yeah, right. drives down underneath <laughs> Dalton Sargent, and Dalton Sargent currently in third place and now about to go a lap down. His next victim could be the 78 of Kyle Weatherman. That turn one condo Chevy for Mason and Mitchell Motorsports. Mason Mitchell, of course, the owner of that team, also the 2014 ARCA Racing Series champion. Dalton Sargent trying to hang on the back bumper there of Eckes. We're starting to get some action down on pit road. Travis Miller for MDM has come in and put on some tires and also looks like Kyle Weatherman, speaking of Mason Mitchell, is going to come down in there and take some tires as well. Bob Dillner is all over it as we watch Weatherman come in. Kyle Weatherman brings his number 78 down to the attention of his crew. At least two tires on this one because we're still under green flag conditions. They're going to go for a four tire stop here. Kyle says his car is just a little bit loose. No, now they're saying two tires. Kevin Reed, the crew chief, says, no, we're going back to a two tire stop. They got to put the lug nuts back on that machine because the caution is out. They're trying to get him back out on the racetrack. Yeah, that's wow. a curveball that they were thrown. We're not anticipating that. They had to get back out on the track. So just as the caution flung lap 131, right after Sargent had gotten overlapped on speed and Weatherman came down for a scheduled green flag pit stop, Christian Eggers had officially lapped the field. Having come down pit road at the worst possible time, Kyle Weatherman lost two laps and wouldn't even receive the free pass as that went to Dalton Sargent. So coming to the restart with 60 laps to go, X and Sargent were the only two drivers on the lead lap, with third place Gus Steen, who also hadn't pitted before the caution, being just one lap down, and fourth place Kyle Weatherman, again being two laps down. One would think it was X's race to lose, but his work was still far from over. While the caution certainly helped him by trapping Weatherman off the lead lap, it also finally allowed for his earlier mistake to catch back up to him. See, his team only had two fresh sticker tires left after he used up a full set from his early spin, and so under caution, he was forced to put on scuffed tires on the left side. Meanwhile, Dalton Sargent, who had been improving significantly throughout the day, would be lining up not far behind Eggis on the restart with four fresh sticker tires. And unfortunately for Eggis, as he had already learned earlier on, tires make a big difference in Salem's worn surface. So within just a few laps of the restart, Dalton Sargent made easy work of him and ran away with the lead. As the run went on, X's car fell noticeably off the pace, and soon his focus shifted from getting the lead back to simply not crashing out. It wasn't long before Sargent caught him back to put him a lap down, and with 12 to go, X's car had become so hard to handle that he was forced to come down pit road to put on newer scuffs, completely ending his shot at the win. And with the race going green to the finish, Dalton Sargent not only picked up his second career ARCA win, but he did so as the only driver on the lead lap. So after spinning much of the early race outside the top five, Sargent came to life over the course of the long green flag runs and took full advantage of the race's unusual circumstances to become the first ARCA driver in over a decade to lap the field. And as of this recording, he is still the most recent driver to do so. But while that race has already gone almost forgotten to time, just this past season in 2023, Sargent's record was nearly broken, as in the Suchi Fast Track 150 at Kansas Speedway, nearly every driver who could have contended for the win or even a lead lap finished faced some type of issue. At the initial start, the battle for the lead was intense between the Venturini drivers of Jesse Love and Dean Thompson and the JGR driver Connor Mozak, as all three of them swapped back and forth for the top spot. But on lap 23, Jesse Love cut a right front tire down out of second place and hit the wall hard enough to end his day. The same fate awaited top 10 drivers Andres Perez de Lara and Frankie Muniz not too long after, putting it into their days as well. Under the caution for Muniz's incident, two more top 10 drivers of Lavar Scott and Andy Jankowiak both lost the lead lap due to lengthy pit stops, presumably for mechanical problems. Then with just over 30 to go, Dean Thompson dropped out of third place for an unscheduled pit stop, reportedly because of a vibration, and lost the lead lap as well. As the race continued under the green flag all the while, the leader Connor Mozak had lapped up to fifth place, when with just eight laps to go, the third place driver Cody Coughlin came down pit road and retired from the race due to fuel pressure issues. And finally, by catching up to Tony Breidinger with two laps to go, Connor Mozak and second place Carson Kwapel took the white flag as the only two drivers on the lead lap. So while Kawapo only finished the race three seconds behind the winner Mozak, every other driver crossed the line one or more laps off the pace, thus making Mozak the closest anyone has come to lapping the field since Dalton Sargent pulled it off in 2017. But the question remains, will the field be lapped again? In NASCAR's top three divisions, the answer is a resounding no, but in ARCA, I think it is more than likely it will. 
even with ARCA recently adding scheduled breaks into their races, the equipment gap has grown so large between the big and small teams that if a skilled driver takes a bad fast car to really any intermediate or short track, they have a small chance of lapping the field. But that's all for today's video. If you did enjoy it, please make sure to hit that like button and subscribe for more videos just like these. I'll have some more Worthy That Bad episodes on the way, as well as a new series I've been working on that I think I'll name Path to Victory, where I'll go over the first wins of many well-known NASCAR drivers and how they got to that point. So let me know what you think of that for a new series, but yeah, that's all I've got for today, so until next time, peace out.